Welcome to everyone, our second um, webinar or, or tasting. And uh, today we'll be doing the, the rosé for those that did not join us last week. You didn't miss out too much. Last week we, we covered the rosé. Last week's video, if you want to catch up, is on, um, is on Facebook and on YouTube. Last week we discussed in quite a bit of detail when we were um, working and talking to Chef John at a sister property of us in, in the UK. We were going in quite a lot of detail on wines of South Africa, what makes South Africa unique as a grape growing country, the Walker Bay and more specifically Benguela Cove, why it's such a unique property given all the soils and slopes, its proximity to the oceans and why these wines have a character of their own and why we only focus on using grapes from the property. So you're welcome to ask any of those questions. Again, I will might repeat some of those um, some of those pointers as we go along as well. But for the first timers there at the bottom, there's a, of your screen, there's a Q&A button that you can hit and you can ask any question at any stage you'd like to ask there. And we'll try to, to cover them um, as, we, as we go along. There's also a chat section if you want to comment on the wine, what you smell, what you taste. But it's always easier if you have the questions in the, in the Q&A um, section. So, um, you, towards end of last week, Annie joined us on, on that episode. Um, Annie Barnos heads up um, the Moody Lagoon restaurant, which is just at the back of me on Benguela Cove. And it doesn't really need any introduction. Um, she's well known for her food. She's got her own style that we'll get to learn over the next couple of weeks. What she's, well, for me particularly good at is her ability to pair food and wine. So look out for, for what's to come. Buckle up. Um, but what I also enjoy about any style is that it's, she doesn't necessarily take the, the, the beaten track. It's always a bit adventurous and trying out all sorts of new and different things. So there's always a bit of a surprise element in there as well. No pressure, Annie. <laughs> and next, <laughs> Annie is, <laughs> next to Annie is a uh, winemaker, Michelle. Uh, Michelle's been working in the cellar alongside me since the very first day. So Michelle is also joining us and uh, wherever I can't tell you or answer anything about the wine, Michelle will be able to answer all those difficult questions that I don't have the answers to. So um, talking of, of food and wine and you guys on, on that side, Annie, I had a quick glance at, at the recipe, but if you don't mind, just as a kick off to, to tell us what you've got planned for today. Uh, yes, not of course. So yeah, good evening everyone. So as Johan said, I had the, or I have our lovely Lighthouse Rosé to work with tonight, or to use as inspiration. So keeping that in mind, I kind of went with all the flavours that you can kind of pick up in the wine, and concentrating on that, and try and incorporate that into the dish. And of course the colour of the wine itself as well. So for tonight we're going to be making a very, very quick salmon dish. So we have our lovely little piece of salmon over there. So I'm just going to take you through the ingredients very quickly and just talk you through that. We have our nice chunky rose petal pesto over here. We're going to be using a little bit later. We have some broccolini, so we're just going to be blanching a little bit later on as well. We have some fresh strawberries, a little bit of fresh tomato. And then, of course, on this side, we have our pink peppercorn infused buttermilk that's just been standing there and simmering for about an hour just to get all those flavors just to develop and kind of season the buttermilk itself as well. So until we start cooking, uh, let's go back to you on and learn a bit more about the wine. Okay. So any of the is salmon, is that is that as all year round available? Is it seasonal now or is it, do you use salmon particularly for this wine or is can you use something like tuna, for instance, as well? Or did you select this fish for, specifically for the rosé? Like I said, it goes, kind of goes with the, the colours. It's, it's a salmon pink wine itself as well. So I kind of went that. You can use tuna. It's just a little bit more meatier than salmon. So you kind of want that sweetness of the salmon just to come through. And that just kind of lifts the wine itself as well. 
but yeah. you can use any seafood like a prawn would work perfectly with the wine itself as well all right yeah rosé is quite a versatile wine and we'll, we'll maybe touch on that a little bit later again um but i think while we We've got a view of you guys there in the kitchen. Michelle, if you're close by, why don't you tell us while you've got a glass of wine there in your hand, do you mind just telling us about the wine, how it was made, what we should be tasting in the wine? I hope yeah, by this sure. time everybody's got a glass of rosé um, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice <laughs> to taste with me. Um, so today, as you guys know, we'll be tasting the dry rosé 2019 vintage from our Lighthouse range. and just. Before we get into tasting the wine, just a quick kind of introduction to this. Um, so the Lighthouse collection is, uh, like, we call it a lifestyle range. So that means, um, in this case, it's wines made from the warmer slopes from, of the farm, resulting in wines that's a bit more fruit-driven, um, a bit riper in style. So um, just a little bit less serious than our estate wines, but still um, amazing quality not lesser quality in any, in any instance, um, just made to be enjoyed every day, um, you know, not necessarily paired with food. Um, so this, this is something you would have a, let's say a bottle of and not necessarily pair with food, but that being said, it pairs perfectly with made some of our base dishes as well. Um, and then also some background on rosés. Um, so I'm sure Johan, you'll touch on this in a bit more detail but later in the in the episode, but um, you get three main types of making rosé. Um, the first one being the mixture of white and red wines, um, which results in a pink wine. Um, these wines tend to be a bit um, bigger in flavour. Um, also, usually your your um, more your sweeter rosés. Um, and then the second style would be making rosé or something called um, saunier, and that would be um, a byproduct of red wine making. So this is when we, in the cellar, the same day the grapes come in, we'll take off, let's say, 10% of the, the juice and it's just concentrate, concentrates the red wine um, for the skin, skin to juice ratio, giving you a more intense color on your red wines and then giving you a byproduct, which is rosé. This also is not also um, always the greatest quality, um, simply because the flavors you get are, are a bit more, um, bigger, bolder. And then the third method, which is the one we use at Pringuela, it's where we farm specifically for rosé making. So in our instance, we use two cultivars, uh, Shiraz and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and then it's farmed and picked at a specific stage where we feel it's, it's going to make the best product. So this wine's would come in and it's red wine made in a white wine style, giving you rosé, which is pink also called Provence style. And this is usually your more elegant, um, kind of lighter in color, um, bit more finesse, um, premium rosés, um, which is obviously what we aim for. So it's, and it's normally dry, which this is as well. Um, so that being said, let's get into tasting the actual rosé, which I'm sure everyone is ready to do. So when we evaluate a wine, we'll start by looking at the color. And as Annie mentioned, this specific one, being the style it's made in. Also, the color is much lighter than you would expect or what a lot of us know for being rosés. Um, so we call this salmon pink, which is why we've paired it, part of why we've paired it with the salmon. And then if we go on to smelling or checking what the aromas are, um, if you just want to smell with me, like Jan said, comment um, what you guys think. It's very objective, but like I get some nice, um, boiled candy, some watermelon maybe, definitely some strawberries as well. And also it has this perceived sweetness, which is um, coming from, I, guess, I would say the, the Shiraz and the berry nuts um, coming from that. So it's not sweet at all, but it gives you that illusion of being sweet. Um, you'll pick that up when you taste it as well. Mm. So let's have a taste. It has a nice palette. Like this is to me, I don't know what you guys think. Like, I get this taste of, you know, when you, you're eating cotton candy and it kind of melts in your mouth, like that sweet sugariness. Um, I guess we can call it part of that boiled sweetness as well, or boiled sweet characteristics, um, which, which is what I get. And then also that strawberry just pops and um, some slight, like, 
Turkish delight or rose water, if you want to call it that. But Ryan, anything to add? No, I think you I mean you've you've said it. Uh, the idea with with this is all those layers of of fruit. Yeah. Uh, it's about expressing as much as as possible the fruity characters. That that's what rosé wines are about. And you mentioned the, those other ways of making rosés by either blending white and red wine, or taking it as a byproduct of red wine making, which are all kind of call it shortcuts for a lack of a better word. And you, yeah. you see those are bigger and bolder. So bigger and bolder is what we want in red wines, but that's not something you're looking for in a rosé wine. It's not bigger and bolder. We're looking for what you see here, which is elegance, freshness, and a lightness, and just the, like a seamless palette to it. You don't want any of those red wine tannins or aggressive um, flavors. And that's also why those, which Michelle also said, why those wines, those shortcut ways of making rosés are often the, the sweeter style of rosés because by adding the sugar to the wine, you kind of mask or hide all those negative flavors. Where these dry styles, there's no cheating or no shortcuts that you, that you can take. But as far as flavors, Michelle, no, nothing to add um, to, to what you said. So... I just see there's one or two questions. I'm not sure if you're, if you're done, but um, some of the questions that have been coming through is, let me just read them here. So yours says dry on the label. Um, often they are not. How do I know if it's dry or not dry? So there's two okay. simple ways, or I would say the, the easiest ways to evaluate whether it's dry or not. Um, when it's not stated on the label. Um, like I mentioned, the, the darker in color ones, and as you said now as well, um, have bigger, bolder flavors coming from those red wines that they were made off of. Um, so usually they add more sugar then to kind of just ease those flavors and um, just make it easier accessible or easier drinking. And then also um, the color and then the price. So normally, if you look at a bottle of rosé that, let's say, it is cheaper than 50 rand and under, that would normally be a, a sweet rosé, um, and which is, again, when you're making a byproduct, I think it's, it's cheaper to produce, and that's also why you buy it for a little less. And then when you're looking at the price class, 70 rand and, and up, it will usually be a premium um, wine made to be rosé, and that, in this case, is usually dry. Mm. That makes any sense. <laughs> I think yeah. So it's basically it's it's not set in stone, but it's it's um, the color of the wine and the price point. I think gives you a good indication, Pratima. That's what yeah. you what you see. Yeah. Then there's yeah, so another question mm -hmm. on this wine. Um, last week's wine was cork closure. This one is in screw cap. When do you decide to do what? Okay, so for the rosé, um, it's nice, fresh and fruity, and it has a slight like fizziness. And for this, to, to keep or to you know, to keep that freshness and that fizziness in the wine, we put it under screw cap because it stays fresher for longer. Where with um, older or bigger, bolder red wines that need some aging, we'll put it under cork because it allows for some micro oxidation, which just eases out the tannins and just makes the wine age nice and makes it more accessible once it starts selling. So I think that's kind of the simplest way to put that. And that's why this is also under screw gap then. Yeah, so and it's, a, I don't, it's not really a, a question, I guess. It's more a, a comment. Um, smells of mulberries, tastes like pomegranate juice. Um, yeah, Michelle mentioned that for, for everyone will sense and experience it differently, but those pomegranate, red berries, yeah. those are all flavors that we associate with, with rosé um, wines. I see Annie is quite busy there in the back. Annie, are you about to get that? Um, yes, yeah, so we're just going to drop the fish in very, very quickly. So we've got our pan on about medium meat. You can see the pan is not smoking. Okay. And then it's quite a little bit of thin piece of salmon over this, so it's going to cook very, very quickly. 
And then always be sure to, gen or to be very generous with your salt, especially on the skin. The salt also it helps draws out moisture. So it's just going to make your skin crisp it up nice and evenly. So drop it into your pan and then always just hold it down a little bit to get all that air bubbles out so you have like it's even, so it cooks evenly. And then you can always also see with your fish as it's cooking, so it's like it do salmon, we normally just cook till about 90%. So it's about 90% cooked and you'll see as it's cooking, it will rise all the way. You'll see the color changing. And then, so we're going to let it cook for about one to two minutes and then we're going to flip it, take it off the heat. Then we're just going to squeeze a little bit of lemon over it. And this, that lemon juice, as it hits that hot pan, it's going to generate some steam. And that's all just going to help cook your fish a little bit more. And seeing as it's salmon, you also don't want to cook it completely dead. You kind of want it to be a little, just kind of flaking as you're touching it and not completely dry. And yeah. is, uh, is using a, a pan your preferred way of doing it? Or is it just because of the, the weather? Uh, I know a lot of people smoke it. A lot of people do it on the barbecue. What is, is that, what's your take on it? <laughs> uh, yeah, look for this wine I like to do it just in a pan smoking is I love smoked salmon who doesn't but for this wine you don't want it to overpower the wine so if it's going to be too smoky it's just going to kill the wine so you, you can do a light light smoke on it but not too much so for this we're just going to do a quick steer on it just to get that you want that nice sweetness of the salmon to shine through okay we'll leave you to it um, let's uh, while we talk a bit more rosé so I just thought like we, we did last week, um, just we talked about Syrah in general and, and wines of the world and Syrahs from across the world. I thought let's just talk broader um, rosé as, as well. So I've got a, a couple of, of slides that I just um, want to put up so just to help facilitate the, the conversation. So... Um, as Michelle introduced, our Lighthouse Rosé is what we're um, sipping now. So, Rosé wines, when it comes to it, and you probably might have this question already, is in terms of color. Um, they, when it comes to color, there's a big, broad spectrum of, um, of color use and pink. Some are extremely light where it's hard to distinguish between a white and a rosé wine. Some of them are quite deep in color, almost bordering onto like a Grenache or Pinot Noir uh, colored red wine. But there is no rules um, that apply as to what your color um, should or should not look like. Obviously, you don't want it to go too orange, like this might be a little bit borderline, but it will still qualify and be certified as a, as a rosé wine. So the same goes as with color. There's no limitation, there's no rules on what grape varietals to use uh, or not to use when it comes to making um, rosé wine. So each winery have something different. They've got a different style in mind of, of rosé that they want to produce. Um, and each grape cultivar gives you a different profile. So Pinot Noir, for instance, um, and the Grenache would be lots of berry fruit, boiled sweets, where something like Merlot or Cabernet might be a little bit more on the spicier side. So they have subtle uh, differences between them, obviously coming from different grape varietals, but also in color, they give you a different pink uh, tint or, or hue to the wine. But you're allowed to, to blend them or use them as single cultivars uh, in our case, we we blend um, a red grape, which is Syrah, and a little bit of, of Sauvignon Blanc. The Sauvignon Blanc just brings back a little bit of acidity and freshness that uh, Syrah is sometimes is, is lacking. Okay, so rosé wines, very fashionable as well. It's the wine that gets the most attention when it comes to, to packaging and dressing it up. So often... It doesn't fit into the rest of the portfolio. It looks completely different and it's all these fancy shaped bottles and labels. It's very trendy um, packaging usually on, on rosé because often it's, it's in photographs or people have a photo of them having rosé. Um, again, just on, on color, I mentioned that 
different grape varietals will give you different colors. Uh, in the wine, in the winery itself, we can also play around depending on the color of the end product we want. Um, we can we can have it as light as this, which would be fairly close to what we have in in the Benguela Cove one. Or you can go all the way using the same grapes with this dark color, and it's all a, a function of of time. You might remember me saying last week when we discussed red wine making that the color of the red wine actually comes from the the skin of, of the berry and not the inside the inside you can see here even though it's a red grape it's still white in color it only gets the, the red color when it's in contact i use the analogy of a tea bag when it when you put it into water it starts extracting color and flavor the same works with wine making where all the the color and aromatics and tannins are extracted from the, the skin. So in our case, we do minimum what we call skin contact, where we keep the, the juice in contact with the berry skin. We limit that to the minimum, so that would be roughly about 60 to 90 minutes. That is the quickest we can go and separate juice from the, the skins. And that gives us this light pink color, which we are after should we have left this wine in contact with those skins maybe for three hours we would have had something like what you see in the middle should we have gone up to 24 hours it probably would have been something more towards the the right hand side on, on the screen so we can play around depending on what you want in your glass as michelle said Normally, premium rosés, dry rosés, this is the color that they are associated with. The biggest producer of rosé wines, which is the guys in Provence in France, which has kind of set the benchmark many years ago for premium rosé, they started this color. So whenever someone is looking to produce a premium dry style, style rosé, this color would be synonym to, to that um, style. Okay, as I said, rosé is often um, photographed um, and people like taking photos of it. Shelf appearance is very important. Rosé is probably the only wine where color is the first thing that draws your attention and that um, talks to you when it sits on, on shelf. So color is important. And I just went and checked on Instagram and I guess it comes as no surprise that the most talked about or hashtag wine of any wines, red, white, Cabernet, Merlot, you name it, is rosé wines. By a long shot, it's in, in the lead in terms of, of mentions, mentions on Instagram. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that, yeah, today is maybe not the greatest weather for, for rosé, um, but often, uh, Rosé has got this association of a summer drink sitting outside next to the pool, which it is. And I guess most people um, enjoy Rosé in summertime. But for me, it's, it's one of those wines that you should always have in the fridge and, and ready to go just because it's so versatile when it comes to food. You know, it's almost like your when in doubt wine. You can always be safe by opening uh, a bottle of rosé because it just works with so many food, chickens, risottos, salads, sushis, uh, tapas, uh, pizzas, pastas. It's just, it works. And my favorite and why I drink a lot of rosé during winter time is it also works really well with spicy food. I like Thai curries or, or Indian curries. It works really, really good. So I'll definitely give that a try after you've tried and his um, salmon. So very versatile. Another question I often get is serving temperature. Yep, rosé as cold as you can, 10 to 12 degrees. And then people ask, uh, am I allowed to add ice? If you have to, then do it. Because um, there's, there's nothing worse than rosé sitting at like red wine temperature. Um, so I'd rather add a block of ice than drinking it semi-warm um, best tip would be to keep it in an ice bucket and just do like small little pours so whatever you pour it, it 
it's chilled. When you do a, a full glass, it, the whole glass warms up and it, you kind of lose it. So I just keep it in the ice bucket and then just do little pours at a time. And ideally, I don't know if you can see your rosé needs those little water droplets on the outside. Um, and then you know it's, that's a sign of it's, it's good to go. So ice, not a big problem, but if, um, if you want to do it, but ideally not. Um, but I won't, it's not frowned upon. Um, I, I, I add some ice to my wine sometimes as well, so don't worry about it. Rosé, um, you might, might not have known. I didn't know for sure until I've started searching um, fun facts on, on rosé. It's the oldest wine style there is. Um, so the first rosés they made, don't ask me how they, how they recorded this, but it was 7,000 years BC. So um, that's a long time ago. And it's only a couple of thousand years later that the making of white and red wines came along. So rosé is the oldest style of, of wine made. Um, so it's been around for a long time, but it's not meant to be kept for a long time. So rosé wines is not a wine you want to sell. It. It's not a wine for keeping. Um, rosé wines, ideally, you want to drink within the first three years of, of its vintage. So in this case, this being a 2019 vintage, so remember from last week's discussion, the, the vintage or the year on the bottle is the year that we've picked the grapes, not the year that it was bottled. Um, so this wine can easily go up till 2022. Um, I would definitely have it be before then, because as uh, Michelle also touched on, rosé is about the fruitiness, the expression of, of all those aromas and the freshness. Um, so by keeping it, you start to lose those flavors and it just becomes a little bit dull in, in, in aroma. Okay, so Rosé um, has gone through a boom and it wasn't short-lived as everyone thought it would be. It's constantly on the up in terms of popularity and sales. Since the early 2000s, Rosé sales has grown threefold. Um, it's unbelievable, like, unlike any other wine category, it's just keep on growing and growing and growing. So it's not just a, a trend or a flash in the pan. It's been going on for about 20 years, the constant growth in, in rosé consumption. So these days, just for, for interest, um, yearly, we drink about 3.4 billion bottles of rosé across the world. So definitely a popular wine and a, a wine style to, to stay. Obviously, yes, what helped it a great deal when it comes to popularity is all these pop stars and rock stars all getting onto the wine making bandwagon. These two started it with a, and they're only making a rosé and it got everyone's attention. And ever since um, stars like Pink have started making wine, rosé wines, Sting, um, Post Malone, I've just heard, I don't even know who it is, but everybody, all these celebrities where they start making wine, they start with a rosé wine for some or other reason. So yeah, rosé wine, um, it's not of any importance, but it's also the only wine to be sold in the perfume sections in many stores. Obviously not something we see around here in, in South Africa, but quite common to see rosé wines uh, these days amongst uh, perfumes in stores as well. And then last but not least, I think the, the biggest, and this is maybe what helps the, the growth in volume, is uh, previously, you know, men didn't want to be seen with a glass of pink wine in their hand. Nowadays, there's this whole movement of real men drink pink or brosé movement, they call it. So more and more men are, are okay to be seen with a glass of, of pink wine and Absolutely, why not? Okay, so um, just moving back to, to, to this and coming a little bit closer to, to home. Uh, for those international people joining us, 
I know last week we had quite a few from the UK and Portugal and Belgium. I know there were some from Holland watching in that send us some photos afterwards. So thanks for sharing those photos. Keep them coming, be it on, um, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever it is you're using. It's always fun seeing you guys um, enjoying the wines and trying out the, the recipes. But for those that haven't been to South Africa before, so most of the winemaking happens down south. We're in this yellow section in a small town called Armanus. And the, this bay over here is called the Walker Bay, which you'll see is on our labels as well. Being quite close to the ocean, it is what we call cool climate wines. So I explained this a little bit last week. Cool, cooler climate wines, the cool climate that we enjoy as a function of our proximity to the to the ocean. There's the Atlantic Ocean passing just by us. This is us, Minguela Cove. With this cool climate that we enjoy, you get this, this bright fruit, the freshness, the vibrancy in the wine. And with our location being quite unique, it also gives like a, a like almost a little bit of a saline maritime feel to our wines that we're looking to preserve and therefore we're only using the grapes coming from from our property so what you're tasting in the glass wherever you are in the world uh, today tonight is a reflection of this small piece of land down south at the bottom tip of africa that's what we want you to experience in the glass so that's Benguela cove um, those of you that have visited us before would know there is no better place south of the equator to have a, a sundowner, a glass of wine or a dinner. So there's Moody Lagoon restaurant with beautiful views of the mountains and the sunset and the ocean while you're enjoying a glass of our wine. Annie's in the back preparing you some food. So. Hang in there. One of these days, we'll all be able to move around and you'll be able to come and visit us soon. Um, as I said, we're basically the gateway into Hermanus town. So just before you eat Hermanus, you have Benguela Cove. Hermanus, as you all know, the home to these gentle giants. Always fun just watching them. Home to some of the most famous beaches around. So I'm saying cool climate for those again that maybe have not visited us might misunderstand the term cool climate um we still still africa we still have a lot of sunshine and manas has got most two of the top 10 beaches in south africa so definitely a, a place to visit for holiday summertime but we do have the advantage of this cooling down effect from the ocean and the cooler nights that we get which helps our grapes and our style of wine a great deal. So this is just some shots of the winery. There you can see our lighthouse sitting next to the winery. So this piece of uh, coastline passing from the southern tip of Africa past Benguela Cove to, to its Cape Town um, is known for its stormy waters. Um, and it's got the highest density of, of shipwrecks along the South African coastline is in this stretch of water passing Benguela Cove. So from there, the, almost a tribute to the lighthouses and the role they played in the old days to navigate the ships past this piece of land or the shoreline um, passing Benguela Cove. So we've got a working lighthouse right next to the, to the winery, which you'll also see on, on the label of this wine. What you see up there is the, the winery with the lighthouse with the ships passing. So from there, the, the name, if you wondered. Obviously, when you visit, um, if you're like me, you're already making travel plans because we weren't allowed to do it for a while. But when you visit us, um, obviously, there's lots of things on offer from wine tasting, all sorts of pairings with chocolate. And he does some pairings with oysters and um, charcuterie and cheese, you name it. It's a lot of, of fun pairing and playing with the wine tasting and how they interact with all the food. Uh, we've uh, soon, or we've become known for our art exhibition. So we've got roaming artists visiting Benguela Cove or ex exhibiting their, their, their work, exhibiting their work. Uh, currently, 
exhibiting is uh, quite a famous artist called Anton Smith. So we've got his artwork all around um, the, the property and they're all for sale. So a lot of fun walking around, looking at them, reading up about them um, all over the, the property. Got some boat trips, there's nothing fun like tasting wine on the water. And then last but not least, I think we're probably the only child-friendly estate. So families are welcome, kids are welcome. It's sometimes a challenge having kids myself, tasting wine with the kids around. They're more than welcome. The parents can sit back, relax, watch the kids while they have fun uh, and they can just sip away on a, on a glass of wine. So quite a popular family destination as well. But getting back to the vineyards and why we're here tonight, um, on the, the rosé and how we go about this rosé in the vineyard and in the cellar, I should just take a sip because I'm, I'm talking too much. And you'll see the wine changes quite a bit as it sits in the glass and there's some air that goes into the wine. The air just helps to open the, the aromas up and the, the, the flavors do change with time as the wine sits in the, in the glass. So when we produce um, or when we grow red grapes for the production of red wines and we grow the same red grapes for the production of rosé, we follow two very different um, ways of, of doing it. So when we grow grapes for the, uh, for the production of red wine, it would be something like what you see on this image where we allow a lot of sunlight onto the berries because sunlight helps with the development of those tannins. It helps for smaller berries and more um, aromas. So what we'll typically do to allow the sunlight in is we'll remove these leaves in the bunch, what we call the bunch zone, to allow the sun to get inside. As I said, with red wine, you're looking for these small little berries. Um, the smaller the berry, the more skin to juice ratio there is. So the more you extract, the bigger, the bolder they become. So what Michelle was talking about, a, a, a shortcut way of making rosé is taking these small red wine berries and taking off more of that juice to get even more concentration in this berry. But what you get is a rosé that's quite deep in color and it's lots of uh, tannins and, and too big and too rich in alcohol as well. So not ideal for making premium rosés. When making or growing vines for rosé, it looks a little bit more like this, where we don't remove those leaves, but we keep like a shaded bunch zone. So we keep all the leaves there. So the bunches are always sitting in the shade. And by keeping it shaded and by keeping these vines happy, so we, we uh, irrigate these more often than we would for red wine. They, they maintain their acidity, their freshness, their, their fruity, perfumey notes just stay intact where if you expose them to the sun, you, you kind of lose some of that freshness and more florally fruity notes that you get in the rosé. So you'll see from these, the berries are much bigger and much more um, pumped up in comparison to the red wine berries. Um, so there was, um, we touched on this. This wine is a blend of, sorry, of Syrah and Sauvignon Blanc. Syrah gives all the beautiful fruit, the richness, uh, that cotton candy characters that you get, but Syrah often lacks a little bit of acidity. So we blend some Sauvignon Blanc grapes with the Syrah grapes and press them all together. So it's not the two wines that get blended, it's we actually blend the, um, the grapes together. So they've been together from day one, pressed, fermented, everything, they go into the winery as, as one basically. So you can already see just by moving the bunches forward, that little gentle pressing action already squeezes some pink juice as the, those um, juices in contact with the, with the skins. So as I mentioned, um, we do minimum skin contact because we want it as light as, as possible. And when it comes into the winery, um, because we're looking for fruit flavors, um, we only use these stainless steel tanks. And the reason being is that in these stainless steel tanks, we've got, we can control the temperature of the alcoholic fermentation. And by keeping the temperature really low, so we'll ferment this at 
12 to 13 degrees Celsius. By keeping it low, the yeast cell produces a lot of those fruity aromas. Where if we have placed it in one of these barrels, for instance, where we can't control the temperature and it remains a lot warmer, the yeast cell doesn't produce all those beautiful fruit flavors. And because of the higher temperature, a lot of those aromatics blow off during the fermentation as well. So rosés are almost 99% of the time, in our case, definitely um, made in stainless steel tanks where you can keep it nice and, and cool the, the fermentation. Michelle mentioned that this wine sits in our Lighthouse range. The Lighthouse range is a range of wines that we select vineyards that give us more fruit forward um, wines. In the case of the red wines, those that are, have softer, more gentler tannins that can be enjoyed a little bit younger, that doesn't have to age three to five years before you can enjoy them and before they actually soften up. So this is more fresh, fruity wines for younger consumption. So obviously it makes sense that, um, that we've got the rosé wine sitting in, in um, the Lighthouse collection. Okay, so before we go back to any, I see there's a couple of questions that came in. Let me just um, see if I can take some of those questions while you, you've got me. So, let's see. All right, rosé barbecue. Yes, yep. Yeah. So, Helen said a rosé barbecue keeps very well. That, that's spot on. Um, so, sparkling wines. It's a little bit the exception to the rule in that the CO2 gas preserves it really well and sparkling wines have got really, really low pH levels. So they can age um, quite a bit. But even having said that, even rosé style, when you're talking sparkling wines specifically, the rosé styles are also best enjoyed young because um, it's again, it's about those strawberry type flavors where the white, uh, the Chardonnay driven sparkling wines are the ones that you, that you want to age. So more questions is, um, what is a Blanc de Noir? Good question. So Blanc de Noir is not a term that we really use that often anymore, um, but it's also basically rosé wines. But um, back in the days, uh, Blanc, I can't even recall of many Blanc de Noirs on shelf anymore, but Blanc de Noir, was a term used for, um, for those really, really light pink um, wines. I, I guess back in the days, this would have almost gone through as a Blanc de Noir, although Blanc de Noirs would have been a little bit um, lighter in color. And Blanc de Noir means white wine from red grapes. So yeah, thanks for asking, for asking that. Another question, so are the lighter rosés better than the darker colored ones? Um, not necessarily. Um, I can't say that for a fact, but uh, I would, with a lot of confidence, want to say 90% of the time, those lighter ones is a sign of the vines and the wine making was all with the intention of making rosé wines. It isn't that shortcut method of blending the white and the red, or it's not a byproduct from a red wine fermentation. So I think fairly safe to say that most of the times it, it would be the it would be the the higher quality one there's a question on temperature we've briefly touched on that before the colder the the better 10 to 12 degrees um, ideally if you if you can if you can control it um, there's another day is it a seasonal wine it is um, to a large extent, but as I said, because it's such a versatile wine when it comes to, to food, I always have some in my fridge, even during winter time, because it, it goes really well with all sorts of, of food types. So yeah, known as a, as a summer wine, but definitely not limited to, to summertime at all. Um, how long does rosé last when it's opened? Um, yeah, so it's not just rosé. I think any white wine in general, a um, little bit of a dif difficult one, but a wine like this, which is still fairly young, you can open this and it will easily last up until three days, depending on the alleage. If there's only this much left, 
it will maybe last one day. If it's up there, then easily three to four days. But if it's an older wine, if it's a five-year-old, let's say white wine or rosé wine, and you open it, it's not going to last that long. So uh, it dep also depends on the age um, of the wine. So young wines, you can keep two, three days. Older white, white wines, open it, finish it. The same goes for, for reds, although reds, because they um, are more protected against oxygen, which the oxygen that gets into the bottle is the enemy of the wine. It's the one that oxidizes it. Red wines are a little bit more robust against oxygen, so they tend to, to uh, keep better. But um, yeah, two days to be, to be safe. But it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm guessing here as well. Let me just see if I've missed any of the other questions. Okay, so there's a question on the ratio. Um, it's, and how did we decide on 7 to 30? Um, we use a 70-30% ratio every year. It's not, we didn't thumbs up this. So it's 70% Syrah, 30% Sauvignon Blanc. Um, first, uh, we had only Syrah. And as I said, we thought it, it just needed something, some backbone to just help lift the wine. So we were thinking of the idea of maybe incorporating Sauvignon Blanc, but we didn't want to blend it afterwards as a wine because we don't get the same effect. So what myself and Michelle did was we made a whole lot of different fermenters, uh, mini tanks, and we played with 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30 different ratios of the two and arrived at 70, 30 uh, to, to give us the, the balance that we were looking for. So ever since we've been going with the 70, 30 ratio and it's, it's been working well and it's it's a one of a kind in that it's co-ferment of red and white. I don't know of any other winery that's doing it, but like most of our wines, we don't necessarily do what others do. So uh, there's always something different or, or unique to them. Okay, so I've been talking a lot. I see Annie is quite busy on, on that side. It looks like the salmon is about to come out or it's out already. Um, any? How's it going? Hi, everybody. Um, well, we're basically done. We're just going to start dating up now. Um, so while you guys have been gone, I just blanched a little bit of broccolini. So 40 pots of salted water. It literally just goes in for a couple of minutes, comes out, put them in a little uh, bowl, and then I just season them up with a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and of course, our Benguilla Cove extra virgin olive oil. That seasoning is very, very important. So try and season everything as you go. Um, we've got our salmon here as well that's just been resting in the pan. So just pop all of these on our plate. They have a lovely nice green color. Eh? Yeah. yeah. Looks so fresh. So a little piece of salmon. And then just little pieces on the side that I cut up as well. So we're just going to pop some of these around. It's a plate. Just for a little bit of greenery. And then we have our chunky rose petal pesto over here. Um, quick question, you said it's, it's very chunky. <laughs> yeah. why, why is it a chunky pesto and not like the fine, you know, like saucy one you usually get? Uh, it's just to add a little bit of texture to your plate. So there's a lot of nuts in there. So you want that nice chunky nuttiness to come through as you're eating so it. What's in here? So it's basically just rose petals, a bit of basil, some parmesan, and some toasted walnuts. Okay. And then you're seasoning, so we're just going to pop this nicely around the plate. Just as you're eating it, every single mouthful, you kind of want all those flavors to work and experience all those flavors around. And of course, we have some fresh strawberries. Well, what is rose over five than strawberry? You're just matching what you mentioned. Exactly. In the all those flavors one. that's in the wine, we're just trying to put all those on the plate. A little tomato. I don't know, for some reason it just works with the rosé, not a lot, otherwise it's just too sour and it's just going to, the acidity kind of overpowers it, but that little bit of fruitiness, that little burst of freshness, this shines through perfectly as well. And then, of course, we have our... So I couldn't sit on the sideline any longer, so I come <laughs> down to see what's happening down here. Yeah? So we got our pink peppercorn infused buttermilk, which we're just going to transfer to our little... 
Again, black pink peppercorns, white pink peppercorns, and not black peppercorns. What's the difference? A uh, black peppercorn is a very like, pink peppercorns aren't isn't really a peppercorn. It's more berry than it is a peppercorn. So it has a lot more floral um, notes to it compared to your uh, black peppercorn or white peppercorn that's very peppery and has that burniness when you're eating it. So this set is just nice and florally and just pairs very nicely with the wine. So we're just going to garnish this up with a little bit of herbs. We have some fresh mint, some fresh basil. That we're just going to place nicely around as well. Again, just for that nice little burst of freshness while you're eating it. Let's get some basil here as well. So that. And then you can also just for decoration, or just to add a little bit of color to your dish, just add oh, some that. fresh. Matching with the color. Exactly. That's what you kind of oh, want. Like and then this nice and hot, so we can just pour that at the table. Oh, wow. There we go. Like I said, it's very nice and light and extremely easy to make. Okay, so while they are trying that, I um, hope you enjoyed the, this episode with us. Um, next week we're doing a, a MCC, so definitely one to look forward for. MCC is a, a sparkling wine. Um, we're doing our 2017 flagship sparkling wine, so please join us for that one. I know a lot of you struggled um, on the wines and didn't, wasn't sure where to get the wines. As I mentioned last week, there's a button on our Facebook page which has got a, a mixed case of all the wines that you'll be um, having over the course of the next couple of weeks. So it's fun, it's a mixed case, one bottle for each of the recipes and each of the episodes that you'll be doing. And it will be pairing something with each of them um, as, we, as we go along. So you can just search for, for that button. Just something else, we've had some people, and thanks for, for the comments and the feedback with all the photos. Some people were asking, is it possible for a different time slot? Because it's um, now that some are gone back to work and school and everything, like Thursdays at this time might seem to be a bit of a challenge. So keep on sending us your feedback. We'll be considering of maybe changing this to a different day. We're not sure yet which day might be more convenient. We're thinking of maybe a Sunday or a Sunday afternoon, but let us know um, about the time slot, uh, which times you, you would prefer to, to do this. But until next week, um, keep those bubblies well chilled and um, sparkling wine is quite a challenging uh, <laughs> wine to pair with. So um, anyway, I'm looking forward to what you, you're gonna be pairing with that. And we'll put that up on the website as well. Right? Yes, so very we'll, We'll share on social media and on the website what Annie's got in store for us for next week as a as a pairing. But in the meantime, um, we're keen to see what you come up with, how your your salmon looks like. So keep on sharing them on, on social media with us and uh, looking forward to seeing you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.